Hi everybody, my name is Dawn and welcome to What's the Stitch, a weekly web series where I answer all of your burning questions about sewing, costuming, and cosplay. You may have noticed I've been on a bit of a Rococo kick lately, and one thing that I had a lot of fun researching last year when I was preparing my 18th century bell gown was looking into the hairstyles, cosmetics, and hygiene practices of people at the time, because I am nothing if not dedicated to the aesthetic. Now, pre-revolutionary France was a picture of excess among the aristocracy, conspicuous consumption all the way, everyone wanted it clearly evident exactly how important they were. There were lots of indicators of wealth in the 17th and 18th century. Aristocracy draped themselves in colorful silks and lush embroideries and bedecked themselves with jewels. And then there was the toilette. Now the toilette or the lavée for the ladies is a daily ceremony of getting ready for the wealthy elite. The toilette for the king was a fully public event with nearly the entire court in attendance. This was very well recorded, with members of the nobility singled out each day to participate. Monsieur de whatever gets to pass the king a handkerchief to blow his nose. The seigneur de fancy pants has the honor of passing on the king's hairbrush. Everyone got to watch as the hair or wig was dressed and the cosmetics applied. And there are many toilette recipe books that survive to the modern day. Most of them uh, were focused on skin and hair care, keeping your face smooth and wrinkle-free, and keeping your hair clean and thick and healthy and nice smelling. Healthy, beautiful hair was considered the cornerstone of feminine beauty, and both men and women used some combination of pomade and hair powder as part of their daily hygiene routine. Records say that hair powder was first worn in full dress in France by Madame de Montespan, who was mistress of Louis XIV sometime in the 17th century. It was adopted quickly in many parts of Europe, but not so much in England until about the 1770s. Uh, there was a bit of a stigma against it for a time, and eventually it was banned altogether due to a bread shortage in England. Hair powder, which really for the most part was a form of dry shampoo, was blamed and so it was heavily taxed because people at the time didn't know that there was a difference in wheat quality of what can be used to make into flour to make bread and what would be made into starch or hair powder. Only the very, very poor used flour, and the cheaper the hair powder you used, the more likely that it would be filled with impurities such as chalk, plaster, or lime dust. The highest quality hair powder was made of finely milled and sieved wheat starch, or sometimes powdered bone and orris root. Wheat starch is made by soaking damaged wheat kernels in water, draining them, and pounding the kernels until they become a fine white powder. There was also a powder variant called Maréchal, that was wheat starch mixed with clove, cinnamon, and other spices that came out a very light brown. Most of the time it was white, but it could also be found in shades of brown, gray, orange, pink, blue, red, and violet. Most of the time it wasn't used to change the color of the hair. This was mainly a court affectation, and it didn't straight up turn your hair white like you often see in period movies or on wigs. The application of white powder on dark hair made shades of grey, not the paper white that we see in Hollywood. White powder on blonde just gives you a lighter blonde. Powder was applied with a bellows, yes like you would see in a blacksmith, with the powdery covering their clothing with a smock or a peignoir, and covering their faces with a cone-shaped face mask to keep them from inhaling it. Because aside from being tremendously unpleasant to be coughing up flour and wheat starch, it's really just not that good for you, and they knew that even then. And they used a small powder puff for touch-ups. Pomade, or pomatum, was used for face and hair of both men and women. It was a scented cream, usually containing some variation of water, animal fat, almond oil or beeswax, and some kind of essential oil for scent. One of the most common mixtures for pomade was mutton, tallow, and pork lard. Now, this sounds kind of gross to the modern-day person, but also keep in mind that these methods were used to keep people's hair clean for many centuries and it's only in the 20th century that we started using synthetic products to do so. The fact is that the mutton tallow and the pork lard were actually really great for conditioning hair because the chemistry of the mutton tallow and the pork lard is actually very similar to our own. So when you rub it into the skin, it doesn't leave behind the greasy residue that vegetable oils such as coconut oil would do. Uh, they were often scented, like I said, with essential oils. Most common were lemon, citron, bergamot, orange, and jasmine. And actually, those citrus and clove scents were natural insect repellents, so it kept the critters out of their hair. That's another myth busted for you. Another thing that you could do is mix maréchal hair powder in with your pomatum. 
This was also really nice if you happen to have dark hair like me. There was even a hard form of pomatum that could be made by introducing more beeswax content to the mixture. This would make it a lot stiffer and allow you to better style the hair. And this was later sold in sticks, very much like our modern day lipstick. Until the 20th century, cosmetics were referred to as paint. Uh, they were worn by all genders and depending on the application and the quality could be used as a way to emphasize class differences. Uh, there were two main colors, rouge and blanc, of course, red and white, and it was actually intended to look mostly natural, but also emphasize the fair skin and rosy cheeks that were the fashionable complexion at the time. There's a lot of myths surrounding Blanc. Most of the time when we think of that, we think of this pasty white face paint that looks more than a little clownish, but it, that really was not the case tended to be a much lighter powder and was very, very, very rarely made of lead. They knew even back then that it was really bad for you, and so the use of it in any kind of cosmetics was actually highly discouraged. But of course, there's always that handful of people who went to dangerous extremes for fashion and have decided that having a pale complexion was worth putting lead on your face. Less costly variations were made from charred bone, rice powder, and alabaster. Conversely, rouge was a term used for any red cosmetic. It was used to paint the cheeks and lips, and though there are still some myths surrounding that, suggesting that it contained lead as well, most of the time it came from natural sources. Predominantly some combination of sandalwood, brazil wood, safflower, wood resin, red ochre, alkanet root, and madder. The most costly of this was made from the Latin American cochineal insect, which was also used to make red fabric dye, something that we've spoken about in a previous video. Depending on the composition, your red shades could vary between pink and coral, and could even go as dark as burgundy. Red pomades even came in what we'd recognize as a proper lipstick by the 1700s. Eyes were left barren and painted, which is why they often appear pink in portraits to contrast with the white face powder. Eyebrows were arched and darkened with coal, elderberries, burnt cork, or lamp black, which is soot from oil lamps. Again, not exactly something that I want to be putting on my face, but you did what you did to be fashionable. Everyone plucked and painted their eyebrows, and if your eyebrows were too sparse, you could always make false ones out of mouse fur. Because that's not gross at all. Another thing that you may see in portraiture, it would be the mouche or the beauty mark. This was made from silk, velvet, satin, or taffeta and attached with glue. They came in different shapes and sizes, and different locations supposedly had different meanings. One on the nose meant you were saucy. For the upper lip, it was kisses. The center of the cheek was gay or happy, forehead for majesty, and a dimple was playful. And wouldn't you know it, they're also super handy for covering up pox scars. Patch placement even took on political meaning in England. Supporters of the Whigs and Tories wore patches on opposite sides of their face, or you could use multiple patches to create a picture on your face. Because nothing is more majestic than having a tree or a flock of birds on your forehead. Patches were stored in their own cosmetic box on the dressing table, and this wasn't a particularly long-lived fashion trend. Towards the end of the 17th century, people who wore multiple patches were accused of having loose morals because many used the patches to hide signs of STIs. And then of course there was perfume, toilet water, or what we call today an eau de toilette. This was used for a lot of things and was actually thought to be very healthy to use at the time. One popular recipe called for a mixture of rosemary flowers, pennyroyal, marjoram flowers, and lavender distilled in alcohol. The cost of cosmetics declined in price and became more commonly available to less wealthy people as the 17th century wore on. Many people made those in their own kitchen because a lot of the ingredients were stuff that could be found in the market and around the home. The popularity of cosmetics started a trend in vanity tables later on that were sold as furniture, and newer houses started being built with dressing rooms facing the north to get the best light. Alright everyone, that is all I have for you today. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of 18th century cosmetics and hygiene. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions or anything you'd like to know the history of, please leave it in the comments below. And if you want to be notified when I upload a new video, just ring that bell. Alright everyone, thank you again for joining me, and I will see you next week. Bye.